The Oregon dunes are like no other place in the country. 40 square miles of exquisite beauty, almost all of it, open to the public. You can get away from people and be out in this kind of surreal environment where you have temperate rainforest and Sahara-like dunes punctuated by lakes. The Oregon dunes span the entire length of the coast between Florence and Coos Bay. A place big enough for people to find freedom. That is a very fast bike. And solitude. We have no shortage of noise and intensity in our world. So to be able to come find a place like this that's quiet is a rare gem. But it's also a place that's disappearing fast. This was a dune, and now it's a forest. We are in the process of losing the last open dune fields that we have on the west coast of North America. Join us tonight as we uncover the secrets and the stories of the Oregon dunes. Every time I see those beautiful summer shots, especially on a more typical wet winter day, well, I just naturally think back to summer road trips with the family and our favorite destination, the Oregon Dunes. It's also a spot that all of us on Field Guide have fallen in love with over the years. Not only is it beautiful to photograph, but every time our crews head out there, we see or hear something new and unexpected. And so tonight in this Oregon Field Guide special, Ed Yon shares with you some of what we found. The stories, the issues, the places worth visiting, and of course, the drier adventures worth trying. If you want to get a sense for what the Oregon dunes are known for these days, come out on 4th of July weekend. We see anywhere from five to 8,000 people come in throughout the week. We've got people from Canada, Oklahoma, all over California. You name it, they're making the trip to come here. More than half the visitors to the Oregon Dunes see them from the back of an ATV. ATVs have become as synonymous with the Oregon Dunes as the sand itself. But these 30,000 acres are also a wonder of nature that invite increasing numbers of explorers to try new only on the dunes adventures like sandboarding and even dune mushing. The mostly public dunes are enjoyed by over one and a half million visitors a year. But those visitors also share space with people like Charlie Day, who have a long history here. This is a soft spot right here. You can really get in trouble in that quicksand. Charlie owns property in the dunes, and he sees firsthand how the popularity of the dunes is changing a place he loves. The fence has been here since 1956, but it's become an increasingly difficult project to keep it repaired because there's just more people out here. The more people, the more problems. The dunes were a different kind of place back when Charlie's parents first brought him here. That was 64 years ago. The roads certainly haven't changed much since then. And this is the high water time of the year. And neither has the simple cabin tucked within the dunes where Charlie's family and friends gathered on weekends. We put a new floor in it here, oh, I'd say 45 years ago. That's the new floor. Well, the cabin's been around since 1900. In 1927, a group of local hunters and fishermen, one of them happened to be one of my ancestors, purchased the property. This, you'll notice, is the old poker table, and there were some hot games that used to go on between the old boys over this at night. Life out here was rustic then, at best. When the wind blew, sand got everywhere, and the massive shifting dunes often covered roads and even buildings. It wasn't an easy place to live, but Charlie's family found peace and quiet here. 
mean, this was, you might call it a wilderness back in the early 20s. I mean, there were no real roads in here. That's how the dunes were for most of the last century, a wild, open, sparsely populated frontier. People would come out to get away from town and enjoy the outdoors and maybe do some fishing. And Sharon Stewart with the Forest Service shows pictures that reveal mostly hikers, campers, and a few road-tripping explorers. But after World War II, better technology made the dunes more accessible and opened up the dunes to a new motorized generation. People started modifying old trucks and stripping off all the weight and putting some airplane tires on them and going out and racing around in the 60s. People started showing up in droves. Then, President Nixon declared the Oregon Dunes a national recreation area. It was the first designation of its kind in the country, and off-roaders took full advantage. The whole dunes were open, so uh, people could go out and ride anywhere between Coos Bay and Florence, pretty much. And that industry just took off gangbusters. So from the early 80s to 1990, we saw this huge spike in use. Those ATVs grew to be a force in the local economy. Towns like Florence and Reedsport, Coos Bay and Winchester, traditional logging and fishing towns, they looked to ATVs to prop up the local economy. But ATVs have changed the sense of peace and isolation that used to be found throughout the dunes. It's become a problem now because the ATVs can go anywhere. They've got so much power and such good tires that, you know, if it's there, they're going to conquer it. On the motorized extreme, we have a race mentality. And then the other extreme are people that want to come out and just get away from any noise whatsoever. That great fox again? It's an incredible challenge. Yep. There's tension here because there's no other place in the West like the Oregon Dunes. No other place that combines ocean, forest, sand, and lakes on this scale. But there's only so much room for everyone to share. And the real downer is that the dunes are actually disappearing. We are in the process of losing the last open dune fields that we have on the west coast of North America. When Kurt Peterson first came here, he wasn't trying to figure out how the dunes would end. He actually wanted to know how they began. The origin of the dunes was largely a mystery. And in fact, in my own entrance exam as a graduate student, one of the questions that was given to me was, what is the origin of the Oregon dunes? And here I am 30 years, finally able to get that question right, and I want full credit for it now. It was Kurt and his Portland State University students that debunked the stubborn myth that the dunes were leftovers from an ancient river mouth. They discovered that the dunes actually contained sand from the eroded Klamath Mountains in California. The sand washed down rivers, traveled up the coast, and piled up against what's now Hasita Banks. When sea levels lowered during the last ice age, the wind blew the exposed sand inland. One can imagine extremely large seas of sand with very little vegetation and probably the odd mammoth walking around looking for something to eat. Eventually, sea levels rose and pushed even more sand inland to form the dunes we see today. But here's where Kurt's team discovered something unexpected. The dunes are actually bigger than most people realize extending all the way into the foothills, but they've been slowly taken over by forest over the centuries. And now, even more dunes are disappearing, faster than ever, thanks to an invasive species called European beach grass. These dunes were on their last legs anyway, but we've hurried up that process by stabilizing the dunes with vegetation, which we now can't control and can't eradicate. Call it the mystery of the runaway grass. It's a mystery Sally Hacker has been trying to crack for five years. If you were to come out here prior to 1800, what you'd see is a very open environment, lots of sand. None of this vegetation that you're looking at right now would be there. Um, it came in with the invasion of the grass. 
As Sally and her team trek along the John Dallenbeck Dunes Trail towards the beach, the landscape changes radically from open sand, grassy hills, to a mucky swamp. The lower end of the dunes trail isn't dunes at all. In fact, it feels more like wading a river. Did you wear your boots yet? Just, just that shy of it. This boggy jungle is actually part of a massive swamp called the deflation plain. In the air, it looks like a forest in the sand, stretching for mile upon mile along the coast. It's a landscape packed with lush native trees, plants, and wildlife. But it's all new in just the last hundred years. So you can see here that really the only sign that this used to be a dune is all the sand that's built up along this trail where the trail's carved out. So this was a dune, open, shifting, sand, windy environment, and now it's a forest. Sally heads west towards the coast and climbs a massive grassy hill. It's here where the pieces of the story start to come together. When you come to the beach, everyone knows you park your car, you walk up over the hill, and you think, oh, now I'm at the beach. And you don't realize that actually that hill didn't exist 100 years ago. That hill is called a foredune, and it's here because invasive European beach grass captured sand blowing in from the coast. So the sand piled up here instead of blowing back there. Without sand to refresh the dunes behind, the wind scoured the land down to the water table. Plants took root, then trees, eventually turning dunes to forest. So this is a photo looking down on the dune sheet. This is where the four dune is today, and this is where the swamp is today. You can see at that time, early 1940s, this whole area is completely open, no vegetation at all. So how did the grass get here? we we'll take a look at it. Sharon Stewart says the Forest Service saw the grass as a good thing. She puts on an old 60s TV show, Lassie, to make a point. Lassie was the ranger's right-hand dog. Lassie spread what the Forest Service considered an environmental message at the time. Well, the story is the large dunes were overtaking residential areas. Uh, in fact, this cabin, we needed to stop that. As you can see, there's nothing to stop the ocean winds from blowing the sand over that hill into the campground and into the lake. That area has to be stabilized. Otherwise, you'll have sand going into those trees, up to the highway, the harbor, and eventually the village. Why this was the message of the Forest Service for much of the 20th century. Plant grass and stop the dunes. They're planting it in rows like, like corn. We were very passionate about it. We knew what was right. In hindsight, this shows us something different. Forest Service didn't really get it wrong. The grass did exactly what it was supposed to. It stabilized the sand. The town of Florence was actually established within the dunes themselves. And if not for the grass, the town and its roads would be buried by blowing sand. There's still enough sand to cause headaches. But inch by inch, the grass is taking over, and the open dunes are disappearing. So here's a um, small, what we call embryo dune, where the grass seedlings have um, sprouted this spring. So eventually, this will build and build and build until it creates a very large hill that is covered mostly with this grass. The grass isn't just a landscaping problem. It's also a threat to a dune's native, the endangered western snowy plover. Phoebe Zarneski, an OSU research student, says plovers suffer when the grass takes over. As you look out here, you can see there's a lot of bare sand. This area would be more appropriate for their nesting area. But as soon as it's taken over by this grass, it's an area that they can't really nest in very easily. The Forest Service has used bulldozers in some places to plow up the grass and create nesting areas. But it's a less than perfect solution. When we go out and we're actually restoring plover habitat, um, the, the very act of using the bulldozer across the landscape 
is not only removing the grass that we want to get rid of, but it's also removing the native plants that, that are there and, and trying to make a living as well. Um, you can't just get rid of the grass and expect everything to be okay again. For dune lovers, it's a sad reality. European beach grass is here to stay. Geologist Kurt Peterson issues what sounds a lot like a final verdict. We are looking at the last gasp of open dunes on the Oregon coast. For the tens of thousands of ATVers who come to the dunes each year, a future without dunes might seem a long way away. In a place this big, there's still plenty of sand to go around. You guys having a good time? We're having a great time. Bree Miller fell in love with the dunes and ATVs. She loves the sport so much that she organized this roaring three-day sand festival on 4th of July weekend. We see anywhere from five to 8,000 people come in throughout the week. We got full-on sand car racing, side-by-side -side racing, quads, anything. You bring it, you want to race it, we have it for you. The point is to bring in money to the local community. You know, there's a lot of people down here that aren't able to do the fishing and the timber anymore, so they need to capitalize on what they've got, and it's the dunes. The staging area at Sandfest is a fashion show of expensive and souped up ATVs. But the real draw is the public dunes, a sand-filled playground 40 miles long and up to three miles wide. The freedom when you're riding the sand is a draw for me. I mean, you can go out there on a day that there's no tracks on the sand. That's, that's the perfect, perfect dune. I mean, you go out there and you're making the first tracks. It's just like flying. It's an incredible feeling. That's what draws all these people here. Freedom. ATVs have long been known as the sport of the young and the male. But the sport has changed a lot. And if you haven't been to the Oregon dunes in a while, you might be surprised by how many women, children, and families are out here? All these people keep the Coos County Sheriff's Department plenty busy. Hey, you gonna put a flag on, right? Rod Roberts has one of the most unique police jobs in Oregon. His squad car is an ATV, and his beat is the Coos County half of the Oregon Dunes. 515, five, I'm out on a traffic stop boxcar. Kind of a 10 and 20 on. There's a lot of land to cover. There's almost 20 square miles of patrol area for us, so it can take four hours to cover it all if it's really busy. This is almost getting to the point where it's insane. With the racing, the noise, and the people, the dunes on a big weekend can feel like a huge party. But Rod says it's nothing like it used to be. I had my son out here riding with me yesterday. Six years ago, no way would I let it happen. Just it, holiday weekends, it wasn't safe for families out here. Um, it was wild. I mean, you'd have 20 women running around with nothing but a G-string on. Um, drunks, uh, we got beer cans thrown at us. I think a lot of people saw the dunes as uh, the Fort Lauderdale, the Oregon coast. At times, there was places at night it was unsafe for even law enforcement to go to. It's a very different story today. Alcohol was banned in the 1990s, and the Forest Service tightened restrictions on camping. The Sheriff's Department put more patrols out, and in time, the free-for-all party scene ended. There are still some problems, most of which crop up after the sun goes down. We got some alcohol and consent. Enforcing the alcohol ban is still a big part of Rod's job. But illegal camping and drunk driving violations like these are small problems rather than the big problems they used to be. Yeah, be careful out there. It's like everybody did a 180 degree turn. The laws were implemented. The attitude on the dunes is much better. We've only arrested one drunk driver this weekend. Uh, so far this weekend, we have not had an injury accident. That in itself is remarkable. Before, back eight years ago, we were going to four or five a day. Well, it's 12.05, what comes next is we'll make a sweep through the dunes. The vehicle operations curfew is at uh, midnight. By 2 a.m., the dunes were largely silent. The quiet is noticeable because during the day, it's anything but.
The big persistent problem that remains on the Oregon dunes is noise. Charlie Day, a local resident, says it's gotten out of hand. On a busy day in the summer, you and I would not be able to carry on a conversation without being interrupted by the noise of somebody with a loud pipe. Charlie owns land near the popular V8 Hill, an access point for many ATVs. He's tried to keep ATVs at bay by posting no trespassing signs, <laughs> but it hasn't worked. So we've seen two guys go by and they both blew right through the signs. I don't think a lot of people realize that there is private property in the Dunes National Recreation Area. Charlie Day is exactly correct. Um, Charlie and I have talked at length lately about some issues out here, and I respect his opinion because he's one of the people who owns land in the Dunes, and he's right. Um, it has gotten worse. Worse, yes, but noise isn't a new problem exactly. Noise has plagued the Dunes as far back as the 1970s. Well, Mr. Wileg, have you thought of having any areas exclusively for the use of noisy vehicles? Well, to date we haven't, but uh, this might be coming. The Forest Service did eventually close half the dunes to ATVs, in part because of noise. But 40 years later, noise is still a problem. The Forest Service was out doing courtesy sound checks. 60% of the quads that went through were over 100 decibels. 100 decibels is about as loud as a typical rock concert up close. 104! The sound problem threatens the sport itself, since more noise can mean more closures. Yeah, bring it up. That's why the Oregon Volunteer Dunes Patrol runs sound checks on busy weekends. Their message? Get checked here or face a fine out there. He'll pull up. We will put the tester on the back of the bike, and that'll tell him if he passes or fails. And it didn't pass, <laughs> so I've got to make some adjustments and make it pass. The ATV manufacturers produce a muffler stock that passes, but all the other manufacturers make mufflers that don't pass, and everybody buys aftermarket mufflers, and none of them pass. Come up real slow again, and I'll watch it. My fear is not having this for the next generation. You know, the sound levels get too high, they have to close things down, and the next generation, the, the little ones you see out here riding now with their parents, that's the next generation of riders. It's an issue that isn't likely to go away soon. Right now, half the dunes are closed to machines, but that doesn't mean that the other half of the dunes sit empty. In fact, about half the people that come to the Oregon Dunes come for reasons other than ATVing. Offbeat new sports like sandboarding have taken off here. Feels like I'm snowboarding in the middle of July, but there's no snow, there's no chairlifts, there's no lines to wade in. And yes, those are dog mushers, turning the dunes into a snow-free Iditarod training ground. Of course, many people come here to do nothing more than play. But Marcus Renerson and David Moskowitz have yet another reason to be here. They traveled all the way from Seattle just to follow animal tracks. There's a great fox coming through here. It turns out that the Oregon dunes are one of the best places on earth to practice the art and skill of wildlife tracking. Porcupine through here. Even though at first glance you may not think that there's diversity out in this landscape, there's so many different species out here. We found tracks of shrews, deer mice, voles, chipmunks, red squirrels, gray squirrels, long-tailed weasels, mink, porcupines, gray fox, red fox, coyotes, bears, deer, elk. I'm sure I'm missing a couple in there somewhere. You might be asking, okay, where's all this wildlife then? Well, Marcus and David aren't so concerned with actually seeing the animals. One of the jokes that we have when we're tracking is we come across an animal, we're like, okay, get out of here so we can go see your tracks now. It's like putting together a mystery. Here we've got two trails of porcupine coming across the dunes here, and you can see their tracks kind of weave in and out. And so you can imagine if the animal was standing here, it had its face here and it was feeding, you can see there's a couple of 
little stalks right here. All the leaves have been taken off where the porcupine probably fed on it. David and Marcus have found a way to learn about wildlife that most people don't even realize exists out here. It's pretty unlikely that an animal that big would have its feet on the ground here. And they're passing that knowledge on to students of the Wilderness Awareness School, who quickly find that the sand keeps a record of everything. I'm actually overwhelmed. Um, I've done trekking for three years and I have never been out here. And um, I'm just, we've walked not even 10 minutes and it's absolutely um, overwhelming. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. These tracks are from insect larvae. These, they were made by a daddy long leg. You can kind of see these faint lines in here. On dunes like these, nothing can move without leaving its mark. I think we're so used to just believing that we're the only ones around. And we kind of forget about the fact that the planet is full of other creatures. When you start tracking, you realize, oh, just last night or a couple of hours ago, this place was busy with like tons and tons of different creatures running all around it. And you're just completely immersed in their world as well as your own. It pulls you into a different way of looking at the world. And as soon as you do that, you can't go back. These people came to the dunes to leave the hustle and bustle of life behind to reconnect with their more primal selves. In the Oregon dunes, that's not hard to do. We have no shortage of noise and intensity in our world. So to be able to come find a place like this that's quiet, where there's possibility for people to just sit, is a rare gem. Many people say the Oregon dunes are unlike any other place they've ever seen. That's because there's very few places like it. The uniqueness of the Oregon dunes are probably best summed up by the fact that they're the only ones that exist on the west coast of North America. 40 square miles of sand, a place to try new things, to explore new places, try new adventures. I love it out here, and my neighbors love it out here. And the people that come down from the valley to ride their four-wheelers love it out here. It's a great place to have fun. It's a great place just to be alone and get some solitude. While the grass may one day take over and noise remains a problem in places, there is for now still enough beauty here in the sand to inspire anyone who visits.